You are listening to Training Matters with Honey Shelton. Training Matters is brought to you by the Training Institute, dedicated to setting the standard for individuals responsible for training effectiveness in banks and credit unions across the country. It's time to register for Train the Trainer Boot Camp, August 11th through the 14th. Go online and check it out, interaction-training.com. Our guest today is Debbie Crawford. Debbie will elaborate a little bit about her background, but we've been friends and we've been colleagues for a number of years and have had the good fortune to do programs live together as well as webinars. And most recently, we did a series of webinars, one for the teller and one for new accounts. And we thought our perspectives and expertise come from two different angles. I'm more on the sales and interactive side with the depositor, or the prospect, the customer, the member, whatever you identify uh, with uh, in terms of those words. And Debbie, of course, is such a specialist on the legal side and does an excellent job of speaking about the legal ease in a way that I understand and you will too. So I thought we'd start off today, Deb, uh, with me uh, asking you to share with our listeners a little bit about your background and maybe uh, elaborate on what you're seeing out there right now that our teller line should really take some caution with. So tell us about you and some hot things you see happening on the teller line, Debbie. Thanks, honey, and certainly a pleasure to be here with you guys this morning talking about my favorite topic, which is banking and, of course, the credit union side of things. Um, I came up through the banking side, and I left there, uh, Hibernia National Bank, in 1987. I always tell people when I was 10 now because I'm 58. I'm trying to hide all those years. But um, it seems like back back in the day, of course, things were a little bit um, – not quite so much crime, postal money orders, cashiers, checks, and things like that were as good as gold. But nowadays, we are coming back to this kind of thinking, oh my gosh, she got this postal money order or got this cashier's check. It's, it's probably bogus. And um, with the decrease in the number of checks, there's the increase in the proportion of crime. And uh, I think those of you that are working frontline these days have to be really attuned. I was... Um, out in Midland, Texas, and I was looking at some bogus postal money orders, and I, they went down to the post office and bought one good one for a dollar for each one of their branches, which I thought was wisdom, and they put them under a black light, and when you put that postal money under, under the black light, that's when you really can see the distinction between the bogus one and the good one. But if you don't have them under a black light, you just can't tell. And these were all for around $900, right under that $1,000 mark for postal money orders. So I think now you have to be really attuned to those kind of scams, um, using your tools like your old-fashioned tools like your black lights and, and so forth to detect because the printers are so much better than when Honey and I were in the business back in the day. Um, back in the day, it was much more difficult to create a fictitious cashier's check. But today, so much, so much easier. And um, I think the crooks will get a hold of a good paycheck. There was a, a group going on in Southwest Airline employees. They were selling their badges and payroll checks, or they were stealing badges and payroll checks to crooks. And they were creating Southwest Airline payroll checks and coming in with badges and, you know, getting them cashed. So I think there's um, a different kind of environment now than we used to see when it comes to check and check fraud, which means you have to be so much more alert and, and more sophisticated, I think, than we had to be. What do you think about that one, honey? Well, I think you're right in terms of the, if you listen to the media, we're all inclined to think that the fraud is hacking and 
uh, electronic fraud. And there's certainly plenty of that. But I like how you brought to the attention, it never gets old that crooks continue to find clever ways to con a teller into thinking there's someone they're not or that their item is good when it isn't. Kind of speaking about items and how the teller line deals in all these transactions, give them a quick lesson on how to be right on top of it anytime you're accepting checks for deposit or to cash them. Yeah, I think you always go back to the components of a check, honey. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with old-fashioned looking at do you have a good Federal Reserve um, number, a MICR number or line, um, do you have a good address, does that institution's check really exist? I've seen fraudulent checks just on the zip code where they'll have like 24426 dash and the dash will be there but not the next four digits. Um, there's nothing wrong with just looking at the face of the check and to make sure if you're taking it for deposit particularly, that the check and the endorsement, the front of the check, matches that back of the check, matches that account. That always keeps it safe. And can your account holder cover the check? Um, I always loved an old bookkeeper I knew. Now she's old because probably been retired for 20 years. But I knew her years back, and she used to always tell her tellers, can you get your money back? And and that, that rule still applies. So, But any funny markings on checks, because there was a – group of crooks that just love turtles and put a turtle marking on each one of their fraudulent checks. And um, I guess they were the turtle gang or whatever. But I, I think you have to go back to fundamentals. And I think the challenge this day is sometimes our younger tellers, particularly who are very savvy on electronics, don't use checks. They don't use that medium. So those of you that are younger out there listening today, you might not even be using checks, and yet you have to look at the checks and break down the components of a check to see is this check perhaps good. And so you have to even be um, more diligent in some ways because you're not used to the item for your own personal side of things. And, um, you know, we know checks are going away, but we still got a lot of them today. And so we have to go back to that. But front of the check matches that back of the check, that endorsement matches that account, will keep your institution out of a lot of trouble. I was talking to um, a president of an institution, and he's got a million-dollar deposition going on and a lawsuit because people took partnership checks and put them in a miner's account. And that should have never happened. I mean, a partnership check would never match a miner's account. And I, I find it's just these simple things that can sometimes um, keep us out of trouble. And a lot of times you'll get an officer or somebody saying, well, you can deposit anything into anything. And the answer is, yeah, you can if you're willing for that anything to come back and say, I didn't get my money and you let somebody improperly deposit it. So I think we've still got... Um, more that we can do on the fundamentals, um, not cashing business checks, not giving less cash on businesses or entity checks. Um, there's still some of that going on out there. And if you do have an officer okay that, then, then it's their responsibility when it goes south. But um, you're going to end up in a lot of difficult situations, sometimes politically, and your officer gets to make that decision if you're the teller but it doesn't hurt to tell them, take a loss on that if this isn't a, a good item or if they're not going to stand behind this person getting the money. So there's always those ongoing um, challenges. Well, and that reminds me, you know, I always like how you put that, that the back of the check matches the front of the check, matches the account name. And, of course, Debbie and I worked on a, a project somewhat together, and, and then I uh, offered assistance and this was a West Coast situation where a credit union had been accepting cashier's checks made payable to the credit union, and they were being deposited in a individual's account. And uh, the loss was staggering. It was almost a million dollars. This fraud went on for two years. So Debbie and I have talked uh, time and time again about how even if you're familiar with the presenter 
that doesn't mean that bypassing that rule is going to uh, assure that you'll be okay. Do you agree with that, Deb? Absolutely. I don't know if you ever saw the outcome of that, but they, the person that was depositing these checks that were made payable to the credit union into her personal account, and again, that's a clear classic example of the check doesn't match the account, but Sometimes you don't always know that because we take checks made payable to the credit union for a loan payment and we took, you know, take checks for made payable to the credit union for an IRA rollover and maybe even to open a new account but not on an ongoing basis. So I don't know if you saw the end result on that. I should have forwarded it to you, but that person was arrested by the FBI and is going to spend several years in jail as they should. But, um, you know, a couple years in jail doesn't get you back your million dollars, and you go to your bonding company, your insurance company, who's supposed to protect you, and you tell them, you know, give me my money, and they're going to tell you no because you didn't follow the standard procedures in the industry, and um, they won't then support the fraud and pay you back your money. It's kind of like wrecking your car, and you didn't do whatever for your insurance, and you don't get your car insurance. So I think that's the tough part of that deal. But, I mean, that was such a sad situation. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was three very young new tellers that took 55 checks over a period of time, and uh, they were all fraudulent, which they, you know, unfortunately played out to be over time. But I think that's a tragic situation, and it could have been easily averted by following that simple, simple rule. But... um, People get caught in things, and they do things they shouldn't do. And I say if their legal counsel tells them go ahead to do things they shouldn't do, then okay, then it doesn't come back to haunt us because, you know, we're following our legal counsel. But um, we have to be advocates for our financial institutions. So, you know, we shouldn't be doing that because this check, you know, I'm looking at a check right now, and it says pay to the order of that business and if it says pay to the order of that business or that person then that's who we're supposed to pay and forged endorsements can come back to your institution for three years in most states i think one or two states in the country like i know florida's one has a one-year rule but just think about that you're a teller you're taking a check for deposit the endorsement is forged then Potentially, you're talking about three years you could live with that liability at your financial institution, and that's that's a really long time if you're the first bank of deposit. They call that the depository bank. And um, I just think now I probably would make a terrible teller now because I would hold everything. <laughs> I would just place a hold on everything I could. <laughs> and all the customers would be calling the president of the bank and <laughs> screaming. But um, I can see why now um, because the fraud level has gone um, so high compared to perhaps times when you and I were in the industry. But can I get my money back? Is there enough money in this account? Is this a good enough customer who's going to cover this check that may be marginal that we're taking? And then sometimes you're thinking, my customer is a good customer, but this check is probably an eBay shopping scheme or something, so maybe I should go ahead and hold it to prove to the customer that this is not a good check, that they have been somehow... Um, duped into taking something and they think they've got this job and they've got to go out and buy stuff and then they send the send the rest of it back or wire the rest of it back and then they end up owing your financial institution three thousand dollars so we we are both um, protectors of our institution and we're also somewhat protectors of our account holders when we know that they've been involved in a scam then we're always trying to tell them this check is not good and let me send it for collection. You can still send stuff for collection. Sometimes it just takes a while. Or let me put it in a savings account and put a 30-day hold on it. Or you can use Reg CC and put holds if you use exception reasons or a case-by-case hold on a local check. But I, I, I think now it's just it's more complicated than just protecting the bank. Sometimes we're protecting this Um, precious customer that has no clue what they've been involved in. No clue at all. We will be right back to hear more from Debbie Crawford about how to prevent fraud on the front line. 
For our listening audience, I want to encourage you to become a member of the Training Institute. And let me tell you why. Your membership of only $99 a year entitles you to attend our quarterly webinars for free. And it also entitles you to a 15% discount off of most of our products in the store. Now, if that's not reason enough to think about it, take a look at Train the Trainer Bootcamp. We will be holding it again this August, August 11th through the 14th, here in Houston. If you're a member of the Training Institute, you enjoy a $200 discount off of your registration. Lots of good reasons to become a member of the Training Institute. Check it out on our store, interaction-training.com. Let's pick back up with Debbie Crawford and hear more about how to prevent fraud on the front line. I certainly endorse the things you said, and I often tell them, if the amount of the check exceeds the credit that you would be willing to extend to this customer based on how they've handled their account, well, certainly... Uh, that's a time that you ask yourself, what are my options? And you pointed all of them out. But when it's a matter of fraud or a wrongdoer duping a customer or the presenter is the wrongdoer, so now we're into character. I often talk about, look at all your options, not just Reg CC. Look at all of your options. Because the amount of time it can take before the supposed maker takes a look at that item. Debbie, do you, uh, w tell me your thoughts on that. If someone's presenting a check and it is for $8,000 and the average balance in this account is $1,100, they've been a depositor for 15 years, they've never been insufficient. Which way would you go of the three options you mentioned about savings, you mentioned about for a lengthier hold, a Reg CC hold or collection? What would you recommend a teller consider? It's really going to come down to, honey, a lot of times where you are geographically. I know that sounds um, amaz amazingly overstated, but you know, if I'm in Crowley, Louisiana, and I had a very similar situation. 30 tellers and the bank president told me they wouldn't hold that check. They know Joe, even though he's only got X balance and they've got an insurance check maybe sitting there, they're going to just tell him don't use it for a week and, and Joe will do that. I mean, he's going to listen to them and say don't use it till we know this thing is good because there's a lot of stop payments on it, like say insurance checks. But if I'm in Baton Rouge or uh, Richmond, Virginia, probably the system's going to prompt me to put a hold on it, and I won't have an option. I would have to get my manager to overrule that sometimes. So the problem is uh, sometimes geographic, meaning in smaller towns we tend to maybe know our account holders better. I'm not so sure, but I tend to be conservative. I mean, the first thing I'm going to do before I give anybody any money or any information is look to see did that person in front of me that's trying to cash that check against that account or trying to deposit that check are they even a signer on that account because a lot of times in the old days as you well remember we would just take their money give them a coffee pot and their wife say their wife would say they'll come in later to sign and they never came in so I might have an old account where I'm trying to give somebody money off that account or cash a check for them they never even signed the account and that's a big problem so then the second thing I go in and just look at that check to see what's going on in that check is it uh, made payable to them is it made payable to their business is it got a good routing number does it have a date on it all of those kind of things is there no weird markings on it and then can they cover it or do they have um, maybe a payroll check coming in every two weeks that might cover it? Do they have good record with us about NSFs and loan payments and so forth? All the things that you were saying. And then I would go offer them choices. Well, I, I, I can't take this check, so you're going to have to either take it to the bank that it's drawn on and get the cash, 
or we can deposit it in your savings account and hold it for a longer period of time because our experience with, say, this type of check is that it takes a lot longer to clear. Or we can send it for collection. We can give them the options if we refuse the item. You know, these are your options. You can, <laughs> And that way it's not like we're just saying completely no. We're giving them some alternatives that they can follow. If I take it for deposit in this checking account, then I'd have to have a hold that made sense. And sometimes there's just not a lot of options for holds. And so I don't want to be exposed for $5,000 if I know this person's got an average balance of $100 for you know 10 years. So it, you've got to look at all those little parts. And then you know sometimes these checks, like somebody emailed me one over the weekend, which I thought, boy, this is a diligent banker. <laughs> It was a state check made payable to two people, but one of them was dead with an and in it, which, you know, oh, I hate that. So, and of course, it was the estate had been settled seven years ago. And I'm like, you know, but try to get a state to reissue a refund check for years back. And how many years would you wait for it? Those are the kind of tough ones, too. And who can sign for the deceased person? So a lot of times that's the executor. If they still have that paperwork around, um, then you get into those kind of deals. But you wouldn't know on that maybe that that was a problem for for a long time to come. So these are the decisions. And, again, whatever your tier is out there, because you know what I mean by that. I mean, if I've only been at the bank a year, I don't have a lot of say-so. But if I've been at the bank 10 years and I'm the head teller, I kind of know which checks I can take and which checks I can't take. That's kind of the things to think about. But I, I think you have to go through all of that in your mind, the account, the check, the relationship. And unfortunately, we have to do it quick, quick. We don't go to loan committee. we got to walk through those five Cs really quickly without going to loan committee and without running a credit report. That, to me, is an amazing thing that tellers out there make million dollars, half-million-dollar loans every day and knowing that check won't clear between two and five days most of the time, and yet we're doing it based on character and capacity. Quick, 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 we're making those decisions. But I'll just tell you, if you're front line and you're at the beginning tier of your career, go slow, slow, <laughs> and bump it up to your boss and let your boss make those decisions because I have a feeling most institutions have a number like what's the number before another person has to look at this check? Is it 5000 10000 25000 Is it a half million? And you shouldn't be taking checks for a million dollars for deposit into an account unless you're, you know, your boss is aware of that because that becomes a loan of sorts. So you have lots of other options, though, to send a check out and get the money back. And um, we got to kind of be like a carpenter. We could use a hammer or saw or different tools in our belt, but which tool makes the most sense today? And that's what you've got to kind of flip through them quickly and see. And then if you don't know, you take it to the next person in the chain of command because they probably do know and they've probably got experience with this particular customer or this particular check. And to me, the greatest strength any person has working at the front line is when they know when to ask for help. And I'm not sure I was really good at that in the beginning. I wanted to, I wanted to seem knowledgeable, um, and I didn't want to be dependent upon other people. But in a bank or a credit union, we work as a well-oiled machine, and we're like a family, and we work as a team. You can't come in with a kind of mindset, I'm going to look it up myself or I'm going to do it myself. There's too many things in the beginning to learn, and... You've got to know when to ask for help, and this is a really important characteristic that will help you over time. We can teach you all this technical stuff. You'll learn more and more every year. Every year I learn new stuff, and I love it because that's why I'm a teacher. I love to learn. But um, the big thing to me is if you don't know, then ask for help because somebody is going to know, and then everybody can do better because of that learning experience. And uh, just don't get out there by yourself on the limb with a big saw and ask for help. And then, you know, which one of these things that you're 
particular financial institution prefers. Like I've been in institutions where the bank president tells me if checks over thirty thousand, we send it for collection. I'm like, wow, you know, it seems easier to place a hold, but that's his decision. And if he makes that decision, then I'm all for it. How about you, honey? I completely agree, and I think the challenge you you, you made such a good point there with talking about when you're new. I would just elaborate on that and say, even when you're not new, the types of financial institutions that Debbie and I are dedicated to helping are very service-minded. And that's a wonderful way to be uh, because it also includes being accommodating. But the risk management side of what you do when you work at a branch is never losing sight that familiarity doesn't overrule a risk that uh, because you know someone or because they do it all the time one bank that i worked with you know a 6.5 million dollar kite by a customer who'd been a customer for 24 years it would have taken this little bank out of business if they hadn't worked out a few things so We're talking about the serious side. You handle lots and lots of items. Most of them are just fine. But I think my advice always to people who work in a branch is this. Be suspicious and don't feel guilty about being suspicious. Never act suspicious. But just like Debbie said, if it's not drawn on you, then you don't know if those funds are good. Uh, You don't have to be fearful with every item you touch, but do be suspicious and ask yourself those quick questions that uh, Debbie elaborated on. Well, before we move to new accounts, let me ask you this, Deb. All this uh, latest, greatest stuff like remote deposit capture, what is to prevent someone of having three accounts with three different financial institutions taking a picture of the same item the same day and depositing it in all three different financial institutions. Yeah, honey, that is a tough one. And I tell you what, not only depositing it, but going to the bank that is drawn on and cashing it, you know, the money is gone then. Um, It's been presented and paid. So that's the problem. And the solutions are not real great. But uh, what some of the institutions are doing is requiring a particular endorsement on the back. So there's kind of like a new endorsement in town and putting like for deposit only or for remote deposit capture only or for electronic deposit only or something like that plus their signature so that when they go to the next bank to present the item or deposit the item, hopefully the teller looks at the endorsement and then the teller can say, no, this has already been deposited. And even if they say, no, it really hasn't been deposited, I changed my mind, and you could say, no, we're not taking it. Because we have to work together on this issue as financial institutions because people don't really understand that. And sometimes it's not that they're trying to cheat or anything. They just don't get that, that they don't understand how to tell if it went through or something. I I don't know. It's crazy. So, um, you know, we have to be careful about that. Just remember on your endorsements that an endorsement's not an endorsement unless it has a signature. So for deposit only by itself is not enough. You can't line through for deposit only once you've done that. If it says for deposit only, it needs a signature. Now, when we stamp credit to the account of the within-named payee, that's when we think we got a safe deal on a check, like the front of the check is matching the account. So if it's a Debbie Crawford check and you you stamped it credit for the account of the within named payee, you're doing that so that check won't be sent back missing endorsement, which some banks still do for some reason. But uh, I don't know why, because the bank of first deposit guarantees that check. So I don't know why they send it back missing endorsement. But because of that, but watch you know credit to the account of the within within name payee when the person's deceased, because now the bank just guaranteed a dead person got that check. So you've got to really be careful using that stamp, because it's not a true endorsement in the sense is that it doesn't have uh, have a signature on it. But those are some of the old things that still come back to haunt us over time, don't they? 
We will be right back to hear more from Debbie Crawford about how to prevent fraud on the front line. July 30th, mark your calendar, 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Central Time. Zach Merrill will be presenting the Training Institute's quarterly webinar called Beyond Customer Service. You will want everyone at your branch to hear this program. So check it out. It's in the store. Get registered. Mark your calendar now, June the 30th. Well, I love our focus on the teller. Uh, like you, that's where I started out. And in a little bit, I'll tell our listeners more about our recorded webinar that we did together because I think it would be a great asset for anyone's library. But I'd like to move on to New Accounts, the other program you and I did together. Of course, and when Debbie and I worked together, I, again, come from this sales service conversation, people side, how to spot opportunities, how to make a, a very positive and lasting impression. And Debbie covers all those concerns that we've been talking about on the teller line. Well, what about this, Deb? You know, when a commercial account gets opened at a financial institution and the owner says, well, I want my bookkeeper to be able to sign for checks. And then later, I know you were sharing with me some of the ways people can take money out of somebody's account without their knowledge that can be very disconcerting. Who's liable? How does all that work when a bookkeeper misuses a commercial account, even if they're an authorized signer? Yeah, when you uh, set up a commercial account, and again, the new account folks are probably dealing with some very complex commercial accounts, so you establish authority. So you get all that outside paperwork, articles, certificates, minutes, all the different things, depending on the type of business. And once that authority is established and the person who is entitled to sign signs off on those resolutions, that sets up the signature card contract. So the resolution becomes probably the most important document when it comes to commercial customers, and it says what those folks can do. So a lot of them have like, you know, can they make deposits? Can they endorse checks? Can they make loans? And I find a lot of times banks, particularly uh, using that, that general kind of a, a resolution, say these employees can do all of these things. So you really have to be careful. Once that customer signed off that these employees can do these things, then if they do them, then the employer is going to be responsible. But if you have a resolution where it said they can do this, but they can't do that, they could get a balance, but they can't write a check, then the bank can be responsible. So it really comes back to who has authority to do what and um a lot of times now the logins are given to, they're handed around in companies. So it comes back to if I give my login to somebody and let them look up balances and they can make transactions and they start sending pop money to their own personal account or, or, or rerouting our PayPal, you know, PayPal credits or something to their own account or payments, then there's, there's a lot of things that they could do to wreak havoc. But you know, you have to get back to your commercial agreement with the customer. So sometimes the bank ends up picking up the tab on that. Now, on personal accounts, it's much worse because of Regulation E. And Regulation E will govern that. But on checks, the customer has to have some responsibility themselves. So the U Uniform Commercial Code, the customer will have more responsibility, and particularly on the commercial side of things. So I think you have to be careful about who is authorized to do what. And I think online banking is confusing a lot of that and passing these logons on to your employees and so forth. So you've really got to keep a handle on your own accounts. And uh, some of it, perhaps, um, the bank could be responsible for and some of it the customer would be responsible for. So it gets back to those resolutions and what they say they can do and not do on there. And I'm not sure, honestly, that we're really great at this, honey. I, I don't know that we're really pointing that out to our frontline 
um, what they can and can't do on those resolutions as clearly as we might be. So the tellers are handling one side and the new accounts setting up the other side. But um, there's commercial fraud. I've seen people doctor up resolutions and signature cards, print paperwork off the Secretary of State's website, come in and open another commercial account that's different, um, signers on it, and it'll all be bogus. I've seen it. 600000 was the last one I heard of. And because the money was transferred, debit from the operating account into this special account that was a fictitious one, you know, the bank ended up taking the loss on the whole thing. So, yeah, there can be some liability depending on um, what level of fraud is going on. Well, sometimes I think it's so beneficial when a financial institution hosts uh, a workshop or a luncheon and invites commercial customers in and shows them the things they need to take precaution against that just as you were saying passing around logins and passwords well what's the consequence certainly it's convenient but a consequence you know can be as you've told me before that someone sets up um, ACH payments going to their utility company or even their credit card and it's debiting out of that commercial account to pay someone's personal bill and if that's the person who reconciles the customer's account or statement it could take a long time before that comes to light i was just going to say because of all these horror stories i've heard over the years and you too in our own businesses i have like triple controls and i'm a little business <laughs> but i think uh, sometimes people can be caught in harsh situations like the one i was telling you where the bookkeeper was um having her uh, own utility bills debited she was dealing with a son who had an addiction issue and um, trying to keep him in an expensive rehab and because of that she was desperate and very nice people sometimes are called to make horrendous choices and then they end up in trouble but uh, your commercial customer can suffer because of that ever so true I know another thing that uh, you and I have had sidebars about is things that have to do at new accounts with Social Security numbers and some changes that are happening in that arena. Why don't you share with our listeners about that? One of the things that's become a huge issue, I guess, is Social Security numbers and tax ID matching and making sure we're picking up the right Social Security number. First, let me remind everybody that there's a new randomization process on Social Security numbers. So if you've had a child in the last couple of years, you might pull their Social Security card. I always have somebody do that in a class. If they've had a child, they pull it, and then you can see that it doesn't have the state prefix on it like it used to. It still won't have the zero zeros for the last four digits. That would still be fraud, or two zeros in the middle. That would be fraud. But um, the Social Security numbers now that we are seeing and are starting to create, I guess, more confusion than ever before, and there's plenty, always been plenty, one is these randomized numbers. And then the second thing is you might see a Social Security card called Not Valid for Employment. And this is issued to non-citizens, and they're not authorized to work but they might be receiving some kind of federal benefits. And an example of that would be like refugees. When you come into our country as a refugee, a lot of times you're put on SSI for a period of time. So you will be receiving some government benefits, and so you would need a Social Security number. So it says not valid for employment. If it says valid for work only, with um, INS authorization or DHS authorization, I think is the way that it reads now, it means that somebody's coming maybe from London and they're coming over here and they're working, so they have a work visa. So behind that Social Security card should be a work visa. But all of those are, are good numbers. They're all good U.S. tax ID numbers. Any of the three are okay. The regular Social Security, the one that's not valid for employment, and the one that says, um, valid with the DHS authorization. You can get any of those um, 
three types of numbers. You also can get this number called an I-10 number, which is an individual tax ID number. And that number is issued to people who have some sort of tax purpose. And that tax purpose might be a savings account at your financial institution. So that number starts with a nine, and it looks like a social security number, but it's issued by the IRS. So right now, this last month, y'all should have received your, what they call a CP2100, and it says, this name doesn't match this social. And then the bookkeepers are screaming and, you know, all those names because it costs us $100, a mismatch. So just remember when you open accounts, like, it doesn't matter whether the Social Security card says Deborah Lee Crawford or Deborah L. Crawford or D. L. Crawford. But the Social Security card is only going to match four letters, C-R-A-W. What we've got to do when we open an account is match that driver's license because that's ID. I mean, you go to Social Security and right on their website it says, this is not ID. This should not be used to ID anyone. So we know our customer identification programs, our CIP, requires us to get um, government-issued ID. So that's not a Social Security card. So we want to make sure when we open accounts that we reconcile those two. Like, say my driver's license says Deborah L. Crawford and my Social Security card says Deborah Lee Crawford. That's that's still going to match. It's going to match for Social Security. And I'm going to go with the name on the driver's license, which got a picture and a description and a signature and is acceptable under my CIP policy. So I think that's been some of the things. And a lot of... um, Changes, maybe, we could say with the non-resident alien world, with a new W-8 out, the new W-8 BAN, and for entities, the new W-8 BAN E, and really making sure we get foreign addresses and foreign tax ID numbers, and if they have them, and and then to make sure that that thing is completely filled out. There's going to be some screenshots on everybody's system now for non-resident aliens where you have to say this is exempt and um, that you have a certified W-8 and when it was signed and what's the expiration date because we're going to have to back up withhold now 30% on non-resident aliens if we don't have a signed W-8. So I think just determining tax status has become a huge issue for new accounts. And, you know, we're sitting there saying, are you a U.S. person? And the person we're sitting across the desk for him speaks a completely different language from us <laughs> and trying to, to sort out those cultural issues sometimes are real challenging some days. But this has been probably the biggest, you know, I, I think the question really ought to be, where do you pay your taxes? If you pay your taxes in the United States, I'm going to have you sign the signature card. If you pay your taxes somewhere else, then I'm going to have you sign a W-8 and uh, attach that to the signature card because it's gotten pretty complicated now for the new account reps. Well, it sounds like it is um, complicated, and there's just so many variations of issues that can come up. I have loved our time today looking at both from the teller line, some hot issues as well as new accounts. And I want to say to our listeners, if you want more information than what Debbie and I were able to uh, come up with today, we have just the solution. And I'll give you all that information in uh, just a few minutes. Debbie, thanks so much for being here today. I have a feeling there will be a good reason to have you back. Thank you, honey. It was a pleasure. All right, everybody. We're going to sign off on Training Matters today, and we'll look forward to uh, connecting with you again. You will want to add our Frontline Fundamentals Package to your bank or credit union's training library. The package includes a previously recorded webinar with Debbie Crawford and myself. One of them is called the Complete New Accounts Representative, and the other is the Exceptional Teller. You can't go wrong, and the price is right. Normally priced, each at $199. We have them on sale in the store today for you for $299. And if you're a member of the Training Institute, you can take off another 15%. Don't miss out on this good deal. Add to your library just what you need for every branch. Frontline Fundamentals. Check it out.
You've been listening to Training Matters with Honey Shelton.